What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Lawyer You Know podcast, where we're going to break down true crime cases and stories. And I said off the top that a lot of them I won't know much about. And the guest is going to bring the details, bring the summary, let us know what the case is that we're talking about. I'll answer questions and ask some questions about the details, but this is not one of those cases. This is a case that is near and dear to my heart that we've been following basically from the jump, all the pretrial motions, all the pretrial action. But I'm thankful that my wife and guest today, Whitney Tragos, has decided to jump into this case, one that surely shocks the system, and that is the case of Sarah Boone and Hide and Seek Gone Wrong. So Whitney, go ahead. Tell us Hello. what this case is about, and let's get into it. So a typical date night for a couple, a little dinner, maybe some wine, uh, and then some games, which I think most couples can relate to. We like to do that ourselves. Love um, games. Have, yeah, have a little date night. So it started out just like that. They were enjoying each other's company. They were uh, drinking some wine together and then decided to play hide and seek. All of that was fine and dandy. Uh, Sarah Boone then falls asleep. She wakes up the next morning and can't seem to find her partner. Um, and may I just interject that in our last house, you and I used to play hide and seek often with our kids and we could never find you. I'd, and to this day, I asked you in our last home, where are you? Where are you hiding? Like for we would look for you forever. We could never find you. I can't give away my secrets. And that's exactly what you would tell me. And to this day, it still keeps me up at night. We're not even in that house anymore. You still will not share with me where you've been hiding. You didn't want to, you know, give it away. So all this to say, if I could have fallen asleep, maybe I would not have been able to find you. So she wakes up uh, and then realizes that her partner had spent the night into in a suitcase. Um she alerts the authorities. Well, first, if I could interject, sure. she goes downstairs, finds him, opens a suitcase. He is no longer alive. Correct. And it's very obvious to her that he's dead. She wakes up in the morning and there'll be details we'll fill in later that really give this story some shock and awe. But so she goes to bed after playing hide and seek, goes downstairs, finds him in a suitcase. Then she calls the cops and they come. Yes. After she had slept all night and he had been in the suitcase all night. Uh, so she calls the cops. The cops obviously come. They're investigating this scenario. She says, tells them that exact story. Um, and that is where it all starts to unfold. And her version of the events is basically we're playing hide and seek. We drink some wine. Absolutely not drunk. I'm not drunk. By the way, after all this happens, she goes to the interrogation room with law enforcement for hours trying to talk her way out of this, which just a little legal tip never works. Don't talk to the cops. Mm -hmm. um, demand you have a lawyer there with you. Invoke your Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. But she goes there and she tells the story. She keeps saying this was unintentional. This was unintentional. This was unintentional. She says he wanted to get in, but she also admits she helped him get in or put him in, but she left a little space for him to be able to get out. All these little details she was telling. But then as the case continues to unravel, we start to hear other details. Like when she got up in the morning, it's not like she sprung out of her bed at eight o'clock. I think it was like noon or something. She was in bed for half the day before she even got up to figure out where is George, her fiance. And we also find out from the cops, from questions that there have been some domestic violence accusations going back and forth, some arrests, some charges back and forth between Sarah and George, her and her fiance. He also has a criminal history. She also says his family hates her. So all of these things that start to make you think, mm, things that make you go, mm, you know, it's sure. like the cops are starting to pick up. Something's not right here. So they keep grilling her all the while knowing they're going to arrest her. Right. She has said she put her boyfriend in a suitcase. But what does she say about um, how the night went? What was their interaction that night? Um, do you remember what she said about like, were they fighting? Was it good? How were the vibes that night? Um, she maintained that the vibes were peachy, that it was your average date night. Um, it, I, I mean, I don't know if it occurred to her that that's not how you play hide and seek, but if there's only two people playing and you are assisting with the hiding spot, it's not, 
it's not really how you play the game. Well, it seems like he may have won the battle of that round of hide and seek, but she won the war in their battle back and forth with each other, even physically, because he never made it out alive to tell the story. So at this point, the cops only have Sarah Boone's story. So how are they going to prove this? Was this an accidental killing, some kind of manslaughter or even involuntary manslaughter? Was there alcohol involved or was this some sort of intentional killing? What was the plan? Things like that. That's what law enforcement had to try and figure out. And throughout the interrogation, actually, before we get to the interrogation, let's play a little clip of how Sarah Boone explains what happened that night. And this is outside her house when law enforcement shows up, her explaining, you know, what happened with the hide and seek, et cetera, et cetera. Woke up. He thought it'd be funny to be put in the suitcase. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to joke with you and I'll zip you up and make him, you know, squirm a little bit, whatever it is. But then I fell asleep. So I came downstairs Thank you, brother. and I was like, oh, f f in the suitcase still. And that's when I found him. I took him out. Susan. So she says, whoops, she says, he thought it'd be funny to be in the suitcase, so it was his idea, but then she makes an admission that I zipped him up in the suitcase, okay? So yeah. who was taking action to cause his death? Her zipping him up in the suitcase, not great. Then she says, and then I fell asleep. And that's the story, exactly how you explained it. When she's in, being interrogated, she adds in exactly what you said. She was peachy, everything was great, relationship was going great. We were all happy with each other. We loved each other. No issues. Our issues were in the past. We were working towards something better. So she's telling all the cops all this stuff. Yep. Then they, they start to find more information. They find receipts of multiple bottles of wine. Is that a big deal? No, not necessarily. Were they drinking wine? No, not a big deal. But she says absolutely she was not drunk. She also says George gets physical when he starts to drink. So those little details start to trick, uh, trickle out. Then... As you just heard from Sarah Boone's own mouth, she, or George thought it'd be funny to be in the suitcase. She zipped him up, then she fell asleep. That's the whole story, right? Well, until potentially the most damning piece of evidence comes out against Sarah Boone, when law enforcement gets her phone and they pull the videos that she took on her phone, and there's really only two explanations for this. Either one, she didn't think they were going to find it, or two, she didn't remember because of how much she had to drink that she filmed this video, and I will give you a warning here before we watch this video, if you don't want to watch it, mm -hmm. um, because it will, it is of George in the suitcase and you can hear him literally begging for his life. So let's take a look at that now. Sarah. For everything you've done to me. Sarah. For everything you've done to me. So for those of you who are just listening to the audio portion of this, the there is a green normal size suitcase, I'll add. There's no way he fits in that comfortably. Um, it, which which would make me agree he probably did choose or allow her to put right. him in there, whatever it may have been. And but he's, he's begging clearly, for his life. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just saying he's clearly awake, coherent while he's in there as he's talking from it. So it's he had to have assisted in getting in there literally begging mm -hmm. sarah sarah please sarah mm -hmm. i can't breathe there's still another minute of this we're going to listen to but you can hear a slurred speech of a female who now as we've gotten to know sarah boone throughout her litigation which is a wild part of this story we'll get to as well that is her voice saying for everything you did to me and here is where it starts to go wrong for sarah boone because when you tell the cops one thing and immediately they have irrefutable, objective evidence proving you're lying, you're usually screwed at that point. Sarah. Fuck you. <laughs> Sarah. F you with a laugh. Again, does this look unintentional? Does it look like she just put him in and then went and fell asleep? Oopsie and wakes up the next morning. Fuck you. Sarah. <laughs> Stupid. Sarah. That's my name. Don't wear it up. I can't fucking breathe, babe. Seriously. Yeah, that's when you do when you choke me. He says, I can't breathe. And she says, that's what you do when you choke me. Okay. And these will be important as we get to the legal aspect of, was it intentional? Was it accidental? What'd she know? What'd she do? Sarah. Sarah. 
Sarah. <laughs> Sarah, I can't breathe. Eh? That's on you. Sarah, I can't breathe. <laughs> this is on you. Sarah. Real around some. I want to give a for it extra. Because <laughs> I got this. Sarah. I can't even understand some of what she's saying because her speech is literally so slurred. Real around. Sarah. Sarah. I can't believe babe. Oh. That's what Sarah. I feel like when you drink on me. Sarah. That's what it is like when you cheat on me, she said. I Fuck you. Free, yeah. You should probably shut the fuck up. And that video is over two minutes long. He was already in there. So you can just imagine how long he was in there, what it was like for him in that suitcase, knowing at some point she wasn't going to come and open it taking his last breaths, he passes away, she gets up in the morning, and now the legal battle ensues. But before we even get to court, she has that multiple hours long um, interrogation. What did you find interesting about that when you watched it? I, her, um, almost like lack of awareness of actually what was happening or what had the, the severity of what had happened was surprising to me. She was still maintaining that really this was all just an accident. I don't know what happened. I don't know how we got here. This was, it, it was, it was chilling almost to see how unserious she really was like taking this. And even to the point where the when the cops told her basically like you're you know being going to be investigated like this is you, you know you are being looked into she was shocked she couldn't believe it what, what do you mean like this was an accident I, I, I um that was very shocking to me she did not know she was going to get arrested right. it is wild if you watch this and if anybody's on youtube you can check out uh, my youtube channel where i broke down the entirety of that interrogation, the entirety of the video outside her house where she explains what happens, all the hearings, all the letters she's written to the judge. If you want to dig in more to this case, go check out our Sarah Boone playlist. But so she gets arrested. And then what else have you found out about the case? Summarize questions you have. Let's let's how, dig into post arrest. Uh, how much of um, that interview, that interrogation and her lack of how much of that can be weighed or played into the mental state and the mental like competence of a, of a defendant? I mean, it, she doesn't seem mentally well. She doesn't seem, something seems off. So this is always something that comes up in criminal cases where people are twisted and have psychotic tendencies or narcissistic tendencies um, whether they're serial killers or, you know, someone in Sarah Boone's situation, maybe it's just one person, but there's a big difference between normal, maybe I'll say, or not having issues and being mentally incompetent to stand trial and go forward on your case. Mental incompetence is you don't understand the charges against you. You don't understand the legal process. You don't understand the penalties. You can't understand or help or aid in your defense. Um, you don't understand what's going on. That's what competence really is. It does not mean that you're manipulative, that you lie, that you act like you don't know what's going on, or that you color things in a certain way that are beneficial to you, or even you act like you don't understand in a way that would be helpful to you. Like I would argue Sarah Boone is doing. To me, and I've seen a lot of her um, court hearings, I've heard her speak, read her letters. She is very, very, the furthest thing from incompetent to stand trial. Cause we've also covered cases where people actually are incompetent and it's very different. Those people don't understand what's going on. They don't understand who the judge is. They don't understand that they're even arrested. Um, and Sarah Boone is not that I would agree with you that there's something not right there, but it's not legal incompetence, which would be the thing we need for her to not be able to stand trial or represent herself or things like that. So she has gone through, I think I noted 
eight lawyers, if that if, if that's correct, up to the point where she is now um, representing herself. So yes and no. So that's kind of an interesting portion of this. She's been through, I think it's eight lawyers. Um, I think one was private counsel, meaning she hired and paid him himself, herself. The rest were court appointed, either public defenders or court appointed private counsel. We don't really need to get into the nitty gritty there, but sometimes public defenders have conflicts. So there are private counsel that's on a, on a court appointed approved list. And when you need a court appointed lawyer, but you can't get a public defender, they'll appoint a private lawyer. So she's had some of them as well. So eight lawyers sounds bad and sounds like a lot. And it is. And it's unusual. People have been asking the whole time in her case, when is enough enough? But mm -hmm. multiple of those lawyers, I think three or four, immediately conflicted off, had to bounce from the case, never even talked to her. Um, it was not Sarah Boone's fault. But oh. at least four of the lawyers, I think it's either four or five of the lawyers, it was irreconcilable differences. It was things the lawyers cited as conflicts of interest or things that in the lawyer world, from my perspective, give me the wink, wink that either Sarah Boone was asking them to do something unethical or she was asking them to lie or put somebody on the stand that would lie or she was wanting to put forth evidence or a theory of the case that was not true. It's just my opinion and my guess based on the verbiage in the lawyer's motions to withdraw and the judges allowing all these lawyers to withdraw or that she is just so difficult to work with that no lawyer could possibly competently represent her. And mm represent her because you don't want to set up an appellate issue where ineffective assistance of counsel because she was so horrible. So at the end of the day, after all these lawyers, the judge said, and it's kind of cool. This was a judge that I know from the mock trial world. He was the coach of, I think, Barry law school when I was running the mock trial for FJA um, in Florida, one of our competitions, really nice guy, really smart guy was like all in. Couldn't have been more excited every round they won, took it so seriously. It was cool. But anyways, this judge ends up finding that she has effectively waived her right to counsel which is very unusual. Hmm. We've seen other cases like Daryl Brooks or Ted Bundy where these guys want to represent themselves, so they voluntarily waive it. Sometimes they have standby counsel or assisting counsel. In this case, the judge said, no, you don't get that decision. You've waived it by your actions because she was writing letters calling her lawyers incompetent jerks, being yeah. dismissive and disrespectful of her, her having to implement fake judges to try to control these lawyers, and the judge is like, enough is enough, you're done. So one of the fun and difficult things about discussing these cases is they are living, breathing things and things are always changing. And in Sarah Boone's situation, the judge did find that she has waived her right to counsel, meaning he will not appoint counsel that the state will continue to pay for for her as she continues to dismiss them or create issues, making them withdraw. But what that doesn't do is remove the opportunity for her to find a lawyer of her own and retain a lawyer of her own, either by paying them or if a lawyer wants publicity. And some lawyers take these cases either pro bono or for free in order to garner recognition or some sort of publicity. We're not really sure in this situation because this lawyer filed a motion or a notice of appearance. And of course, his first thing that he filed is a motion to continue. But in his notice of appearance and motion to continue and the motions that he's filed, he has mentioned that she has retained him and he has responded to the wanted ad that Sarah Boone hand wrote and the public read and saw some people laughed, some people mocked it, but it actually worked. So now Sarah Boone has a private retained lawyer on her case. She will no longer get any court appointed lawyers. The judge isn't going to allow that to be a way that she can delay the case more, continue the case more. But also a lot of what we discussed on the podcast has to do with her representing herself. This might not be the end. This lawyer might also withdraw like the eight lawyers before him. This is lawyer number nine. And if he does withdraw, then Sarah Boone will once again be representing herself. Are there any other um, benchmarks that you'd need to meet to represent yourself as a mentally competent person? Or is that as is fit to stand trial? You can represent yourself also? So you would think that you would have to take some mental competency test or understand what's going on before you can represent yourself. That is not the case. Um, you are assumed competent unless mm -hmm. somebody finds you incompetent. And how do you get found incompetent? There are mental health professionals that give you an evaluation. If they find that you don't understand those things I talked about before, they will discuss and, and give an opinion to the court that you're not competent. And then you're not competent now until somebody finds you to be competent. Um, but there are situations like in the Daryl Brooks situation where either a judge or a lawyer can say, judge, we think he needs to go be evaluated before we allow him to do that. Nobody's done that in Sarah Boone's case to this point. 
So she is competent until found to be otherwise to represent herself. She continuously reminds the judge every time she talks to him, every letter she writes that she did not choose this. She does not want this, but her trial is coming up very soon. And we're going to see her in action, literally representing herself with her life on the line. She was charged with second degree murder, by the way, not an accidental crime, but in Florida, those lesser included like voluntary or involuntary manslaughter can be included with second degree murder at trial. Is the, um, suffering of the victim uh weighed when they are bringing charges against a defendant like watching that video I, like is so unnerving it gives me anxiety just seeing it what he went through is that factored in to this so case the verbiage in different charges can go to kind of people's motivations or mens rea as we say their mental state their criminal mental state at the time and I think when you look at the verbiage in either an intentional homicide or second degree murder, which is like a depraved heart killing that you wanted to kill this person, which is what they went with, or if it would have been voluntary manslaughter where um, something happened, you were mad and you know you you turned around and killed somebody or just involuntary manslaughter, was totally accidental. You were doing something negligent and caused somebody's death. Those types of words, was it reckless disregard for human safety? Mm. Was it a depraved heart and mind, meaning you hated them, you were angry, you were nasty. Was it, they did something to you, so you responded with this? And that's where I think that back and forth in the suitcase could have come into play for where they got to second degree, which is the absolute highest level. I don't think it was some planned out premeditated act to get to first degree. It was somewhere between second degree and, and voluntary manslaughter, meaning intentional manslaughter, where it seemed to me like she knew if she did not get him out of that suitcase, it was reasonably likely to lead to his death and she still did nothing about it. That's more of the voluntary manslaughter side to me, but zipping him up in there, laughing at him, saying this was because you choked me and cheated on me, that's where it kind of gets more to the second degree, goes to motive, and the jury's going to have to determine what was her criminal mental state at the time, and I think those things you mentioned will be used. How much does alcohol factor into that criminal state of mind? Because even though she maintains that she was not under the influence, I think that video and finding the multiple bottles of wine would make uh, people think otherwise. So how much would that be factored in if she said, I, I have no idea what, what was happening. I completely blacked out. I passed out after that video. She turned her phone over. So it makes me think she must have not even been realizing that those videos were on it. Um, so how does that play into her criminal mind and how it would be evaluated? So a lot and a little, or I should say a lot and none at all. Mm -hmm. A lot in that she lied about it. And then when you hear her speech, if I'm a juror and I'm like, why is she lying about this? But she's clearly lying about this. And in a lot of these cases, it's all about the criminal defendant. And if they're like, you're a lying, you're trying to cover this up. It usually doesn't go well for them. So mm -hmm. I would say it matters a lot there, but in Florida, and just like in most States, voluntary intoxication is not a defense. If you choose to do drugs or drink alcohol to the level that it makes you drunk and you do something, you can't then claim, mm. I didn't know what I was doing. It was outside of my control. Another thing we haven't really talked about, but kind of works in here and with competence is insanity, legal insanity, not guilty by reason of insanity, different than mental incompetence. Legal insanity has nothing to do with what you are right now or how insane or sane you are right now before trial. It is your mindset at the time the crime was committed. Did you understand right from wrong? Did you understand the consequences of your action that you were committing a crime, that you were hitting, hurting somebody? Did you think you were putting uh, clothes inside the suitcase and zipping it up because there was something going on in your mind, whatever it may be, mental health disorders? That is what insanity would be, you know, temporary insanity, which would be a legal defense. But again, alcohol does not fit into that. It's been tried and lost. So, which makes sense, right? From your perspective, just from a layperson's perspective, you shouldn't be able to, you know, choose to get drunk and then not be responsible for your actions. So do you, I mean, just trying to assume or guess, do you think that she was denying alcohol was being consumed so that she couldn't be held responsible, I guess, or so that she could, I, what would, I'm just trying to think why she would deny that repeatedly. So I think I broke this down in my video with what my guess is, or I don't remember what, what I said, but at the, at now I would say it's probably what I said at the time too. I think if you go watch and listen to that full interrogation with the cops, 
She was using big words. She was telling them how educated she was and how smart she was and how she had to financially support George. And, you know, she had a prior husband and a son and she was trying to make herself seem like she was put together. She had it all together. George was the wild one. Everybody else is bad. She's good. And no, she wasn't drunk. She doesn't drink that much. She doesn't like to get drunk. She would say things like that. So I think she thought she was going to convince the cops how great she was. She is not the kind of person that would commit a crime like this. They're going to see it that way. And she's not even going to get arrested for this. That, that's my guess. Yeah, it's it's truly interesting. I think uh, as as mental health awareness grows, and I think as more people discuss it and we're seeing it far more, um, do you think that the legal world will catch up? Because it's clear to me that while she is not ruled out, she's fit to stand trial, she's competent. There's, and she's there's, presumed innocent as well. The state sure. has to prove that she was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. There's very clear, I think, from a reasonable person, most people would look at that and say, there's something going on mental health wise. Do you think the legal system will catch up? Do you think that they will be able to like put things in place that, I don't know, you could use that as a defense? Do you so think it, it, it is in place? Uh, Certain mental disorders already do allow you to um, plead insanity or in certain sentencing phases, it is used to, as a mitigation factor, which means if you're looking at 20 to 40 years, um, 20 being the minimum, 40 being the max, if you have a mental health disorder, you'll get more towards the minimum than the maximum things like that, lessening your prison sentence because of a mental health issue. But I, I think we have to be careful about will the legal system put stuff in place to, you know, help this. I don't think Sarah Boone, from, this is just my analysis. I am not a mental health expert at all. I don't think she has anything that should give her a mitigating factor or give her some kind of defense to her actions. Mm -hmm. I don't think any mental health disorder affected her actions as we have seen them in the interrogation and in the videos, right? Now, what's the jury going to determine? Do they think the state can prove it? What evidence will come out of trial? We'll start, we're still waiting and seeing. We're not convicting her yet. But if it's presented in the way that we've seen, I don't see how a mental health disorder should act as a defense for Sarah Boone. And we have to be careful that people don't try to use that or fit into boxes, which by the way, already happens. Yeah. We've had, you know, clients who do fit into boxes and ones that don't fit into boxes, but that have tried to fit into boxes in order to get some kind of insanity defense. So there are already people out there that try to use that, try to game the system, try to use mental health to get out of charges. And so it is a, everything in the law is a balance. Everything is a totality of the circumstances. Everything should be done in the interest of justice. And if you're the victim or your family member's the victim, I don't think you would want somebody to just be able to claim, I have a mental health disorder, therefore I'm not responsible for any of my actions. Sometimes some disorders get there, but other ones very clearly don't, in my opinion. Do you think that there's ever um, a benefit to representing yourself? <laughs> uh, no, I can't ever think of one. Maybe like if I wanted to rep my, represent myself in a civil case, then maybe. I, I like the way I work. Um, I trust myself. I know I'll know the case. If it's me on the line or my family member on the line, I think I would do the best job in the criminal world. And even that people would say, no, don't do that. And I probably wouldn't, I probably would still hire a lawyer, but you know, I, I could try, I could maybe think of some benefits. Although at the end of the day, I think I would not end up doing that in the criminal world. Absolutely not. Especially if you're not a lawyer already, we have seen already in the situation where she's been representing herself for a couple months. How do you do research? They're giving her a computer. It doesn't work the way she wants. How does she call witnesses? How does she do depositions? She doesn't even understand what she's trying to argue. She's written motions that she doesn't even know what she's asking for. The judge and the prosecutor are trying to be helpful, as helpful as they can. But at the end of the day, the prosecutor wants to convict her, right? And they're, the prosecutor's offering up experts. She doesn't know what experts to hire. She doesn't have any colleagues she can ask about who's the best. So her only recommendation is coming from the side that wants to beat her and convict her and put her away for life. I, I don't see any, that would be like me trying to go win a debate in Chinese when I can't speak Chinese. Like that, that, it's really akin to that in my opinion. Yeah. It's scary. Um, do you think she was wanting to represent herself or do you think she was maybe using it as like a delay tactic to just keep get, trying to get new lawyers? And also, do you feel like this was almost 
a punishment or a consequence of you have not behaved properly. So now here you are, we're handing you over to your own good luck. So a couple questions there. I want to try to make sure I answer them all. If I, if I'd missed one, uh, let me know. Okay. So I don't think she wanted to represent herself. Mm -hmm. I think she wanted a lawyer to do what she wanted them to do to interview and talk to a million witnesses to get a million experts. And there are, we've had clients. I want to do that too. Oh, this tape that has me admitting to doing the crime that's falsified. It had to be cut up, get an expert to try to figure out who cut that up. Right. And we're like, okay, if you want to spend the $25,000 it costs, but she's working with state money and state funds. So it's limited. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think eventually lawyers were like, those arguments don't work. We can't do that. I can't spend a thousand hours interviewing a hundred people that you want me to interview. Um, so I, I think that was kind of the rub with the lawyers. Do I think it was a punishment? I don't know about it. So no, it can't really be leveled as a punishment, mm -hmm. but do I think the judge was like, Oh, well, none of these lawyers are good enough. None of them will do what you want them to do. Well, then you can do it. That's and true. now you have the best lawyer in the world, Sarah Boone. You are your own lawyer. Do I think there maybe was a little bit of that in there? Probably. Um, and then lastly, the delay tactic. I think that at first I did not think she wanted to delay. It seemed like she wanted to go to trial, prove her innocence, or at least prove that it was an accident, which I do think that there are some things that she has that she could argue to prove it was an accident. Um, like she passed, like she was planning on opening it up in five minutes, but she really did pass out. That's mm -hmm. again where I think the drunk could come into play. Not that she's not guilty, but that she had a plan to open it up and then literally passed out. And that's why she slept in so long. Um, but I think they had proof she was like on her phone for hours before she even went downstairs, which is wild. Wow. But I, I didn't think it was a delay tactic at first. Now looking back, I think it probably was a delay tactic. Uh, without this video footage that they got off her phone, like if let's just say case is as is her, her words, how do you, how do you think this would have gone differently? Or how do you think this would present differently in trial? So do I still have her interviews outside the house and the interrogation? Yeah. With all, right. all of I, that. If I had that as a prosecutor, it still, to me would feel like an easy win maybe for voluntary or involuntary manslaughter. I think it would be harder to get to the second degree murder charge. Um, I, I think the video helps with that. And that's probably why they charge that. And they may not even win on that, which they'd probably be okay if they convicted on voluntary manslaughter. But I think even with her words saying I zipped him up in the suitcase, that'd be a pretty good case for involuntary manslaughter that even if she didn't mean to end his life, her actions were so reckless. She was disregarding his safety and his life. She did those actions that brought about his death that I would still have enough to where I'd feel confident as a prosecutor to go um, forward even without the suitcase video, but I definitely think that suitcase video is the best evidence against her. Do you see this trial being long and uh, only because she's representing herself? I'm thinking of myself walking in there with, I have no, I, I have no idea how to represent somebody in the court of law. I, I imagine there's going to be a ton of objections. You can't do that. I mean, how do you see this going? So that's already happened in the hearings that she doesn't know what sustained or overruled means with an objection. She doesn't know the right questions to ask. She is very sure of herself though, I will say in these hearings. So I have tried a case as a prosecutor against a pro se defendant and it was supposed to be maybe a two hour trial. It ended up going two days. It was a little misdemeanor. Well, it wasn't little. He accused uh, the police department from stealing money out of his wallet when they arrested him. He represented himself in another case for the charges of disorderly conduct and won. So our office was like, we cannot, you know, let him go in again. And uh, the entire police department, it was a very small police department at the time. I think it was like seven officers all came and wanted to testify to make sure that they didn't lose this, where he's accusing them of stealing money. And we filed charges of filing a false police report, a little misdemeanor, nothing could have been done in two hours. But because it was a pro se defendant, everything has to be over explained. You have to be careful with what you do. They're going to make arguments that are, you know, improper and irrelevant. You give them a lot more leeway as a judge and as a prosecutor. He tries to garner sympathy throughout the trial the entire time with the jury and how, oh, ho-hum, I don't know what I'm doing, even though he had tried another case and won. Um, and so we had to be gentle. We had to be slow. Mm -hmm. But we also picked up as the trial was going along, the jury realized how much time he was wasting how annoying he was, how mm -hmm. frustrating he was, how difficult he was making the process. And we could tell they were with us from the jump, basically. So it made it a lot easier to go through. 
uh, took the two days, convicted him, and he actually got jail time for that crime, which normally you probably wouldn't get jail time. Um, but because of his actions, because of how bad it was, because he lied about the police, he did end up going to jail for it. And in this case, I believe the trial was supposed to last one week. But now that she's representing herself, I think they've put it on a two-week docket. So again, they think it's going to last twice as long as it's supposed to last. Wow. It's not an overly long or difficult case for the state, but she will make it more difficult. Explaining things to her will make it more difficult. They're going to have to send the jury out for her to ask questions. Um, we just saw in another case, uh, Robert Tellis, where he was going to represent himself. He was actually a lawyer, but like a probate lawyer, um, arrested for, I think, murder as well. I think it was first degree murder. And charged and tried for that. And when he was on the stand, he was saying things like, I represented myself for a while here, or the prosecutors didn't give me this. It was totally unfair. Things lawyers would never argue or say. Right. So when that type of stuff comes out, sometimes you have to deal with it. Sometimes you have to send the jury out, explain to the criminal defendant, you can't say that. Also, when you represent yourself or in Telus' situation, the judge allowed him to testify in a narrative form. It's a question everybody has. If you're representing yourself and you want to testify as a criminal defendant, what do you do? Well, the answer is you sit up on the witness stand and you just talk. You tell your story. There are no questions, but then the state gets up and gets to cross-examine you. So you get to testify in narrative form with no questions coming your way. Tellus did that even though he had a lawyer because he wanted to do it, do it that way. And maybe because lawyers are not allowed to ask questions if they know their client or a witness is going to lie. So sometimes we ask the judge, hey, can you just let them testify in narrative form? Judge gets what that means. They pick up what we're putting down. They get on the stand. It's their right to testify. They tell their story and we move on. So if Sarah Boone wants to testify, I had to guess I would say she will. Yeah. She just gets on the stand and talks. I I, I just like, I, I keep going back to like, what, what does she think her defense, like how is she going to defend herself? I guess. Is there any possibility that like these videos or the, the videos from her phone or the interviews that she did with the police officers, is there any possibility that those would not be able to be admitted? So in case you haven't noticed, a lot has happened since we recorded this podcast. So we are doing a couple updates to make sure that it is fully and accurately up to date when you're listening to it. And now format's going to look a little bit different too, because there's a hurricane outside. So we're recording this during a hurricane to bring you accurate and up-to-date information on Sarah Boone's case. And Whitney, that was a great question you had a couple weeks ago when we recorded this. And it's kind of funny. It's almost like fortune telling when you have similar questions and you see how a case is going to go. Mm -hmm. And you asked, is all that stuff coming in? Yeah. The suitcase video, the interrogation video. And funny enough, two major events have happened, legally speaking, since we recorded our video. The first is the defense officially noticed the battered spouse defense. Yeah. And there was a hearing where the state objected to it, did not want to allow the defense to even make that argument. We'll get into what those reasons were. And then the second thing focuses in on the interrogation. So the suitcase videos at this point, everybody seems to think that those are coming in. But funny enough, the defense actually said, Sarah Boone is the only one that can explain what happened during the few minutes before and during those videos. Yeah. So he's like, there's context. So wait, there's more. And we give the, the criminal defendants the benefit of the doubt, the presumption of innocence. That's what we're going to do for Sarah Boone too. So she apparently is going to take the stand. It really seems like she's going to take the stand to explain what happened in those suitcase videos. So it seems like those are coming in. Remind me to say something else about her potentially taking the stand later during the other hearing we're going to talk about. But secondarily, the interrogation. Mm -hmm. So we know it's two hours long. We know she admits all sorts of things. She says all sorts of things in that interrogation, including, like you mentioned before, this was unintentional. This was an accident. This wasn't intentional. Yeah. I didn't mean to. Yeah. Well, the defense is trying to keep that out. They have filed a motion to suppress to get rid of all statements made because they say Sarah Boone's rights were violated. They were that, that she was not read her Miranda rights appropriately. Okay. And what that means is, you know, everybody's heard you have the right to remain silent. You have the right to an attorney um, during and before the interview. If you can't afford one, won't be provided to you. Anything you can and say, anything you say can and won't be used against you in the court of law. Do you understand these rights? Do you waive these rights, right? So that's generally what Miranda warnings are. Well, the defense has made the argument and they tried to get the specific card that law enforcement is supposed to read. And in this case, they did not read it verbatim, which I don't know why. That's always the easiest way to do it. But they left out the very last question, which is, do you understand these rights and are you waiving these rights? So their main argument is she was coerced and forced into giving the, that two hour statement because the officer said, we have to talk and did not read the very last question. So let's talk about that. 
Um, and based on that hearing and, um, or I should say that motion, which the judge has not decided on yet. I believe the hearing was supposed to be today, but since the hurricane's hitting Florida, no hearing in Orlando, it was canceled, pushed to another time. So we don't know whether or not the judge is going to suppress them, but what were your thoughts on that? I, my, those videos were by far the worst thing for her. Right. I think that's why I was thinking about it earlier. Like her, in my opinion, her only chance at having any sort of defense is if people did not see those videos. If you didn't, if you didn't hear that interview, if you didn't watch that video, I don't know. The judge has to watch them, in my opinion. I don't know how he can make a ruling on whether or not her rights were violated without watching this video. I cannot imagine that he would allow that to not be entered if he watches it. It is so telling. Also, I, she's on my nerves, honestly. She's on my nerves. I don't, you cannot play hide and seek. You cannot leave your boyfriend in a suitcase and then just try to like finagle your way out of it by saying like, I didn't, I didn't know. She clearly was not using any sort of right to silence because she was yapping. So, so there are a couple of different angles to this. So first you say the judge has to watch it. So the judge doesn't technically have to watch the interview, the, the interrogation. He can, if he wants to, it's available. Uh, the defense did not link the actual YouTube video with timestamps in their motion, which from my perspective, if you wanted the judge to watch it, that's how you do it. Because if you link something, they would, they don't want the judge to watch that. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so, so the judge can watch, doesn't have to go. Well, here's what I'll say. One thing I'll push back on that you said was if he watches it, he has to let it in. That's not how the judge is going to make the decision. The judge is going to make the decision based on, does he think her Miranda rights were read to her appropriately or were her constitutional rights violated by not having a knowing an intelligent waiver. That's what it really comes down to. There's no magic words. So while there is a card that law enforcement officers use, there's no magic words. You have to basically check all the boxes. So the judge is going to look and say, did the officers appropriately uh, advise her of her rights, that she has a right to remain silent, she has a right to a lawyer, not just a lawyer, but a free lawyer, and not just a free lawyer, but a free lawyer before we talk to you or even during the interview. Did they say those words? And even on video, you can look at it, and the defense even admits all of those words were said. They even asked her a follow-up question saying, nobody forced you to do this, right? Nobody promised you anything. And she said, no. And then they said, do you understand everything? Do you understand all these rights? And she said, yes. If you watch- but Hold on. Sorry. But what they didn't do, they didn't ask her, do you waive these rights? So it was a knowing and intelligent understanding of her rights, but did she waive it? That's the question before the judge. If you watch those interviews, at no point does it seem even for a second that she is being- coerced, led. She was literally talking from the moment they showed up. All, I mean, she never stopped. She was going on and on and on telling them way more than she needed to, but it wasn't because they were like pressing her. At no point did it seem like she was trying to withhold. She wanted to keep, you know, things private or not speak on certain things. At no point did it seem like that if you watch those. Which makes, which leads me to believe, how can you watch that? Or how can you take this, you know, she, she was coerced or she, you know, her rights were violated. How can you even evaluate that as a judge without watching that video? I think any reasonable person that watches that interaction and that conversation would be able to say at no point does it seem like they were not respecting her rights or like she had so there is a totality of the circumstances aspect of this that you're talking about. And what they'll take into account for that is she gave them her phone. She unlocked her phone voluntarily. She spoke to them. She, she came to the police station voluntarily. She yeah. reached out to them and said, can I come back and get my phone? They didn't force her to come in. Um, when she came in, she said, I have questions for you. So in order for Miranda to apply, it has to be a custodial interview. Okay. So even to get to whether or not you need to have the Miranda rights re uh, read to you, and in custody means not just handcuffed or in the back of a police car. That's obviously in custody, but sometimes there are gray areas. And generally speaking, in custody means you are not free to leave. A reasonable person would not feel like they're free to leave, like the cops are making them stay there. And if you are in custody, you still might not need to have Miranda read to you if they're not asking you any questions. Mm -hmm. But if it's an interrogation or an interview where they're asking you questions and eliciting information from you, now it is a custodial interrogation where Miranda must be read. I don't think anybody's going to argue this was not a custodial interrogation. She was in the police station. They weren't going to let her leave at that point. They were asking her questions, but she brought questions for them. Mm -hmm. She wanted to talk to them. So I think they could have had a conversation that wouldn't have been an interview for the cops interviewing Sarah. Sarah was interviewing them, asking them all sorts of questions. Yeah. So I do think totality of the circumstances does look that 
This was not coerced. This was not forced. We have to talk. Doesn't mean we're going to talk no matter what. And even after the cop said, we have to talk, she said, is anybody uh, promising you or threatening you or forcing you to be here? And Sarah Boone said, no. Right. So all of that, I think, is really important totality of circumstances. I think there's a very low chance the defense wins this, but they are trying to suppress that two-hour interrogation, just like you asked. So since we first started recording the interview, more stuff has happened, and that is one of them. The defense has done that. And that's also another indication that Sarah Boone now has a very experienced defense attorney, mm. not just one, not just two, but I think three lawyers now have filed notice of appearance to represent her for free. Another little thing that's happened is the all some of the, not all of them, three of the private lawyers that were court appointed private counsel for Sarah Boone all asked for the full flat fee of $15,000 and in open court said she was uh, gaslighting us. She was one of the most miserable people to work for. We were constantly have to explain things over and over again to her. And the judge was like, you know what? This all, this seems unusual and extraordinary and like really hard work to deal with her. She, instead of giving $15,000 total, which is what is allotted for a court appointed private attorney. It's like when the public defender is conflicted out and you have a court appointed attorney, that's a private lawyer. Not every lawyer is on the list. You, you can be on the list if you want to. And if you want to, you choose to accept lower payment, mm -hmm. like $15,000 for second degree murder. Like that's very low, but that should have been the totality. All of them should have had to split it. But the judge was like, this seemed like so miserable. All three of you are going to get $15,000 each. So that's what she just, uh, uh, determined. So all of them got that money. Um, but you can see these motions, like a motion to suppress, when we get to the second motion hearing that happened, having a real lawyer on your case or multiple real attorneys that want to work for you make such a difference, things that she would never have known how to do or never done appropriately at representing herself, which it seemed like was going to happen in this case, but is no longer. Although one thing I will say, not a lot of case law in this motion to suppress. Uh -huh. I would have expected some cases, some either differentiation from cases where the statements weren't suppressed and some analogies or what's similar with cases that were suppressed if they just didn't read that last sentence. And there was none of that. Yeah. And I've done a lot of these motions on both sides when I was a prosecutor and as a criminal defense attorney. And when there's not a lot of case law in these motions, usually it means it's a losing argument. So I think there's only a very small chance, maybe one to 5% that he actually gets those statements suppressed. I do not think he will get those statements suppressed. The second hearing and major thing that happened, which is what makes the suppression motion even more important is the defense officially said they're going to go with the battered spouse defense. Meaning Sarah Boone, was abused in the past by George Torres, the victim. Yes. And she was so uh, hurt by him in prior DV uh, situations that she was in fear for her life. So that is why she trapped him in a suitcase and left him there to die, basically. Right. Um, she has experts that are going to corroborate that. And from the courthouse steps, her new lawyer, James Owen, said, the Torres brothers are dangerous. George Torres, the victim, abused Sarah Boone many times. There are police records, reports, arrests, witness statements. They're trying to get more witness statements. Um, that corroborate this. And then he brings up that George Torres's brother is in prison for allegedly taking the life, I believe, or seriously injuring, I can't remember now, I shouldn't say taking life if it wasn't, seriously injuring his significant other. Mm. That is completely irrelevant, will never come into this okay. case. He even admits it, but he's trying to get out ahead, get a public narrative, uh, make the victim look bad because in a battered spouse defense, which is technically self-defense, the um, likelihood of danger or aggression or abuse of the victim can become relevant. Okay. So that's what's happening here. That's what the defense wants to do. The state objected. So what are your thoughts now knowing that's what the defense is going for? Um, if this is the defense they're going with, number one, uh, well, her, because I know she in the past has been arrested for DV against George also. Will that now come into play? And if it does, will that will that have any bearing on if she's been arrested before she's been read her Miranda rights before she's very aware of the circumstances surrounding, will that have any, you know, crossover there? Will they be able to use that? So a couple questions there. So I want to start with your last question, which was the prior Miranda rights. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good question. I'm glad you asked it because in the transcript and on the video, we remember the, there was also body cam video video mm -hmm. outside of the house when the crime occurred um, where she talked. Well, in the interrogation, they said, we're going to read you Miranda like we did again from how we read it to you yesterday. It's exactly the same thing. So they read it to her before at the house. They read it to her again before interrogation. When you get your Miranda read to you one time, it does not matter. Every time there's a custodial interview, you have to have your Miranda rights read to you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Even if you have some prior crime or for her, even if there was a prior conversation where they had read her Miranda rights. So no, that doesn't okay. check the box just because she's been arrested before and read her Miranda rights before. But all of her prior 
arrests, allegations against George Torres and anybody else that saw her abuse him, including maybe Brian Boone, which is wild that the defense put Brian Boone, Sarah Boone's ex-husband on their potential witness list to prove battered spouse. And there's an entire interrogation of Brian Boone. Again, all of this stuff in detail, I break down on my YouTube channel, like each one of these issues we're talking about is a full hour video. Yeah. But Brian Boone, all he said was they abuse each other, especially when she gets drunk. She's angry. She's nasty. She hits me. She abused me, but I didn't do anything physically back. She's so little. She didn't hurt me, yeah, but no. that doesn't seem like a very good witness for Sarah. Not Boone, great. Right? No. Um, so yes, all of her prior arrests, prior complaints about DV. I shouldn't say all of her prior arrests, right. all of her prior arrests that Related have to do with to yes, DV against George Torres, the current victim that'll come in. And that is basically the subject of the state's objection. Mm -hmm. They're saying judge, no way this can be battered spouse. We object for a couple of reasons. Number one, she already abused him. Yeah. So battered spouses are the ones that are the victims, right. not the perpetrators. And she's the perpetrator, mm -hmm. even in the past. Yeah. They're saying they have evidence of that. But number two, they're saying you can't argue battered spouse because of exactly what you mentioned earlier in the podcast, which again was weeks ago. Sarah Boone said this was an accident. Yeah. It can't be an accident and self-defense because for self-defense, that is an affirmative defense. What is an affirmative defense? Well, an affirmative defense is you admit that you did the facts that they're accusing you of doing, but you say, even though I did that, it's not criminal and it's not criminal for X, Y, or Z. So the insanity defense, for an example, is an affirmative defense. You say, yes, I did that, but I was insane. Mm -hmm. I did not understand what was going on. I didn't know right from wrong, et cetera, et cetera. Battered spouse, just like self-defense is the same thing. I did that, but I did that to protect myself or because I was in fear for serious bodily harm or fear for my safety, which in this situation, Sarah Boone's doing. And in that hearing, the judge said, you guys can't have it both ways. Mm -hmm. um, you've never said this was self-defense. And the, the attorney said, judge, this was self-defense. In that hearing, he has basically abandoned the accident claim. He has basically abandoned that this is unintentional. Okay. What did you think when you heard that? I'm wondering if, um, was there some sort of like, okay. Is there a different penalty, a different charge if it is, oh, an accident versus, oh, I, it, defense, yes. like self-defense? So second degree murder has with it uh, an intentional element that she has a depraved heart. She wanted to hurt him or potentially end his life, even if it wasn't planned with malice aforethought, which would make it first degree. Okay. But accident could go into an involuntary manslaughter. Okay. Meaning, yes, I was doing this thing. Yes, it was dangerous. Yes, he died. But in no way did I want him to or intend him to. Okay. So, and that carries with it a le lesser prison sentence. Okay. So if, if anything, that could have been her split the baby defense. Right. It was an accident. So yes, not this high defense where I could spend my life in prison, but this lower one where I might get out before it's over. Well, guess what? That pretty much goes out the window with self-defense because you're saying, yes, I committed I the acts that would rise. I even wanted him to die right. or wanted him to stay away from me because I was so scared for my life. Yeah. That rises to the level of the higher crime. She's admitting to those facts which is why it's such a huge deal and a shocker after listening to the interrogation, looking at the body cam footage for her to now say it wasn't an accident. And she must have said it was an accident 35 times. I mean, that Easily. was all she was saying. It was an accident. I didn't know. I fell asleep. It was an accident. We were great. We were playing around. We were, you know, it really is wild to me that she has this um, confidence in the words that she speaks. It's almost like she believes if I say it, people are going to believe it. So what I'm trying to figure out just for my own understanding is, is she switching the defense because she feels like she will get a lesser punishment or is she switching the defense because she feels like maybe this is more believable than what I said previously? While at, I think none of it is believable at this point when you're flip-flopping like this, but I'm just trying to figure out the, you know, m mental game that she's playing. So, a couple of different things. Number one, um, I think, and this is just a guess, that her lawyers told her if we go with accident, mm -hmm. you still could get convicted of involuntary manslaughter and go to prison for a long time. And maybe she didn't like that. If you think back to that attorney's fees hearing I was talking about, one of the things they complained about with Sarah Boone is they would explain to her these things and she just wouldn't listen. We have to explain it a million times. She would want to take these routes that we didn't agree with. Okay. So my guess is that might be one of them. Yeah. So she's not going to get a lesser sentence going with self-defense. It's basically all or nothing. Mm. She's going to probably get the big one or out scot-free and not guilty by uh, about her spouse syndrome defense. So that, that I think is how you look at it that way. But how does the state feel about this? Well, number one, the state has already noticed a brand new witness and that seems totally unfair, right? Well, the brand new witness they're going to say is going to say, 
before law enforcement even showed up, Sarah Boone was saying this was an accident. She said it was unintentional multiple times. Yeah. And they have a witness now at the scene or right after all of this took place where she said it's an accident that they're going to put on the stand to say that. And number two, you can see how important that motion to suppress is now. Because if they get rid of that police interrogation, they get rid of her saying it was an accident 35 times. Right. Um, but if it comes in, this defense gets even harder. And lastly, we talked about a narrative testimony. I told you what that would look like. I told you about the Robert Tellis trial. Well, the state in this hearing about battered spouse defense said, if Sarah Boone takes a, takes a stand, we think she's going to have to testify in some kind of narrative because my guess is her lawyers aren't going to want to, he didn't say this explicitly, but this is what he was inferring. Her lawyers aren't going to want to put her on the stand and know that she's going to lie or say something that's completely in opposition to statements that she's made in the past. One of those is going to be a complete lie because she yeah. is literally at saying point, the opposite thing. Yes. At this point, she is a liar. <laughs> I, I don't know what it is, but like she is a liar at this point. I think that that is something that's going to come out. And that's something that's going to be a really big deal at trial is her credibility. Everything is pointing to, even including her lawyer, that she is going to take the stand. Yeah. It makes sense that she's going to take the stand with a battered spouse syndrome because she's going to have to describe why she felt the way she did, what was their relationship like, explain away all the times that she was accused of abuse, yes. and including with Brian Boone and uh, George Torres, and of course, explain what happened in those minutes before and after she took that video because the defense is basically inferring to me as a lawyer that what happened when she was done with that video forced her as a battered spouse to leave him in the suitcase, yeah. meaning he was threatening me and right. saying all these things. So I had no other option. And once he's in the suitcase, like he is no longer a threat to you at this point. So why not think. call the cops? Why not like, you know, leave? Why not get out of the situation? I mean, there's so much that there's a lot of explaining she has to do. So the judge had made, has made his ruling. Uh, the state didn't want them to even be allowed to argue battered spouse. The judge denied that objection. Okay. They are allowed to move forward at this point with battered spouse. And since that's been approved by the judge, she's continuing to meet with mental health experts, putting her experts on, getting her witnesses together. So is the state. Mm. Like I said, the state's got that witness that's going to say it was un or that it was uh, unintentional. And they're producing, they're going to have her meet with one of their experts. And one of the state's experts mm. is going to be able to interview Sarah Boone and say whether or not they believe she's a battered spouse. They're going to have all the prior jail records, all the information of the accusations going back and forth. So that battered spouse syndrome is going forward. We know that answer. We don't know the answer on the motion to suppress, although we don't expect that two-hour interrogation to be uh, suppressed. So what, uh, you, she, if this was your client, how, what, what are you doing to defend this one? I, 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 so from my perspective, and I've been thinking a lot about this, and I even talked about it on the YouTube channel because a lot of people are asking me, you know, what would I do? What would my defense be? How would I defend her? And with what we know, right? Because there's always infinitely more information than what we know that the lawyers know, that the client knows, that the state knows, that law enforcement knows. Right. But with what we know, and we know that they're going with the battered spouse defense, which also the state argued, oh, none of these other lawyers were going to go with it. That's not true. At least one other lawyer had a similar expert and was going to go with this defense. He even admitted that or said that, I should say, in the fees he hearing. But what would I do? With the battered spouse defense, I would not abandon mistake. I would not abandon accident, okay? Mm -hmm. I would do my best to still work it in but not in the same way that she said it. I would say, because because again, I got to deal with the words that she has said, right? right? I can't just pretend yeah. like she didn't say that. Yeah. So she said, everything was fine. They're playing a game of hide and seek. He gets in the suitcase. She zips it up, but she leaves enough room for him to get out, okay? okay. She takes those videos making fun of him, okay? Mm -hmm. And then if her statement is something like, then he got angry. Then he said, I'm going to kill you. Then he said, I'm going to do this to you. I'm going to hurt you. And she freaked out. Because yeah. she is a battered spouse, because he's abused her before, because she um, uh, knows what happens right. when he she makes him mad, especially after he's been drinking. Yeah. So now she's in fear for her life. Now self-defense kicks in, and that's why she leaves in the suitcase. And that's the accident. She left him in there not to hurt him, but because she wanted to keep him away from mm -hmm. her. And she was like, holy crap, what do I do? And she had too much to drink. And she went upstairs, and when trying to figure out what to do, she passed out, fell asleep. When she woke up, she didn't remember what happened, found him downstairs. So the inclination to leave him in the suitcase, which no normal person in their right mind would do to somebody they didn't hate or want to hurt, that is the self-defense. She left him in there because of the battered spouse syndrome. The mistake comes in in that she fell asleep. Yeah. She did not mean to fall asleep. She did not mean to leave him in there forever. She didn't mean to take his life, but she did mean to secure him in there to protect herself. Now, while that's the best defense I can come up with, mm -hmm. If I was going to respond to that as a state, I would say, why not call the cops? Why not call Brian Boone to come over and protect you? Why not call a neighbor? Why not leave and then call the yeah. ambulance to come over there and help him? Mm -hmm. Why not do a million things sure. that could have still saved his life? Yeah. Okay. That's number one. 
Number two, using those videos didn't seem like you were scared. Didn't seem like you were nervous. Seemed like you were instigating. Yeah. Seemed like you were antagonizing. Seems like you were poking the bear. Yeah. So to say, does not seem like a battered spouse. Yeah. Most battered spouse defenses have a lot more of a sad story than this situation where there is legitimately an abusive spouse or parent or, you know, somebody in your life. Right. And there is indication of it. There are pictures, there's bruising, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And it's not mutual most of the time. Doesn't yeah. mean it can't be, but most of the time it is not mutual. So I would still try to work in mistake. I don't know how you don't work in mistake. It makes no sense that this was the decision you made as self-defense for this long of a period of time. And when did, like he said, when did he stop becoming a threat to your safety or your life? Um, so that's that would be my best defense. What, what do you think of that? Um, I, I, I keep going back to the the original um, interview that she was doing or when the when the body cam footage was there. And I she kept making it a point to, to say that, you know, they hadn't drank much. We hadn't we really hadn't drank much. Then with the video of the suitcase, you can hear her slurring her words. And I just keep thinking, why would she why? Why did she like say that she wasn't drinking? I because what you were just explaining, how you were explaining it alcohol being involved actually would make me as just a, a juror or somebody being like, oh, well, I mean, I, I guess I could understand that a little bit more. Like she wasn't in her right mind. Maybe she, you know, she wasn't thinking she falls asleep. A person that's not been drinking alcohol, you just pass out. I mean, that doesn't track. So anyway, I just keep going back to that body cam footage and how much, I mean, just the lies that are so evident. So there's no doubt she cooks herself in the interrogation. That's the hardest stuff to get over is your own statements. But there's also no doubt in my mind mm -hmm. that she thought she could talk her way out of this. That and she thought she was going to explain it away and trick these cops into thinking, oh, yeah. this guy that's you know a horrible guy and abusive, this very nice lady over here could not have done anything wrong. She 100% thought she was going to talk her way out of it, which so many clients do, almost never works out. And the fact that you said she will you know, take the stand or probably will take the stand makes a lot of sense because I think she still oh, thinks yeah. that she can like talk herself or convince people of something like she really does not have a, a self-awareness. And that could have been a rub with some of the prior lawyers too, that she wanted to take the stand. They didn't want her to, yeah. they didn't feel comfortable. I'll say yeah. with her taking the stand. But the last thing I want to mention is this case is supposed to go to trial October 7th, which is just, you know, a week away basically or two weeks. Um, and the hurricane delaying this hearing, mm. the motion to suppress, the battered spouse, all the stuff that has to get done, the additional witnesses the state's putting forward, that the defense has to have the opportunity to depose. There is so much that has to happen before this trial that, you know, again, we have to keep in the back of our minds the possibility that this case gets continued. Yeah. The defense has already asked once. I can almost guarantee they're going to ask again. The state during the battered spouse defense hearing said multiple times, we may have to ask for a continuance judge. And you better believe if they ask for a continuance, the judge is I would think most likely going to give it because they've been on board doing their job the whole time. And if all this stuff comes up that they need to prepare for, the judge is probably going to let them. They've granted multiple continuances for the defense. So we are going to track this trial. We are going to watch this trial, follow it. Um, let us know what questions you have in the comments section. Leave a review on all podcast networks that you watch it on. Like the video. Make sure you subscribe and watch all and listen to all the podcasts we are doing. Thank you, Whitney, once again for another one. That's all we got. Till next time, we are out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, The Lawyer You Know.